Today's episode of Sorry Partner comes from presenting sponsor Element 3 Health. Did you know that Medicare now covers bridge? Studies have found that working out your brain and strengthening your social group is just as important to your health as physical fitness. Through the Element 3 Health Benefit, some Medicare plans now cover your ACBL dues. To find out if your plan includes the Element 3 Health Benefit, visit element3health.com slash podcast. So partner up with Element 3 Health at element3health.com slash podcast. Hello, I'm Bronya Jenkins, and you're listening to Sorry, Partner. Hello and welcome to Sorry Partner, a podcast about bridge and all things interesting to bridge players, brought to you by bridge partners and friends, Catherine Harris and Jocelyn Starts. On today's program, we talk with American champion Bronya Jenkins about her love of games and how that led to her new role as the executive director of the American Contract Bridge League. Plus, she shares her top tip for developing players. But first, let's kibitz. Hi, partner. How are you, Jocelyn? I'm well, Catherine. How are you? I'm great, and it's great to see you. I, I, I'm I, missing our games. We haven't been able to play as much lately. I know. I miss you too so much. Honestly, I haven't been playing that much bridge lately. I don't know what it is. I, I have relished having a bit more time to myself and not running around trying to play all the time. Um, interestingly enough, I was at work and I get a frantic series of texts from a friend who very much wants me to come to the club and play with someone that I've never even met. Was this because they needed someone at the last minute? They needed someone at the last minute. Okay. So she was trying to persuade me and I was like, you know, I, I was kind of counting on a quiet night at home. But she she was really basically saying it would be a huge favor to her mm. and also that this is a lovely person and a wonderful player. And all that was very compelling. I just I had sort of in my mind it was the end of the work day and I wasn't going to play bridge that night. But I realized that my biggest apprehension was that since we hadn't played together, we'd have to get together on a card. And she said well, he'll play, he'll play your card. Of course, he'll, he can play anything. He'll play your card. And I kind of think, okay, that's nice. But then like, what does that mean? I play different things with every single one of my partners, but sure. I'll think of a, I'll think of like my ideal. I still needed to go over it with him. I still needed to explain under what circumstances Drury is on. I still needed to go over garbage stamen. You know, it's like you can't just write garbage stamen on your card, even though some people think it means one specific thing. It doesn't. It means different things in terms of what your rebids would be. And he was extremely gracious and lovely. And he met me a good 40 minutes before the game started. And he was very willing to go over all the details that I wanted to go over. But I just don't know of a shortcut to doing this because I really do think that there are so many details and I just don't quite know what he'll play your card really is intended to mean. Yeah. So thoughts. Yeah. I just, I think there's playing your card and playing your card and I think that in itself is a shorthand for they'll be flexible and do their best to play the conventions that they know that you like. When you were speaking, though, I was thinking how many of our guests over the course of the entire time that we've been doing the podcast have talked about simplicity and about not taking on conventions until you really know the ones you're already playing, rah, 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 rah. And 
I just realized now that honestly, I think I would be happy to just say, okay, well, let's play takeout doubles, stamen transfers in 1430. And leave it at that. And leave it at that and just and just see what it's like. And yeah, I mean, because that's that is the other way that I could have gone. But you know me. I mean, at one point I said, So do you play Gazilli? And he said, <laughs> he said, Yes, I do. And I'm like tempted to sort of get get aligned with him on Gazilli. And then I said, This is ridiculous. I'm not doing it. But I hate to give up the possibility that we could have a hand that would be so appropriate to use Gazilli with and get to a really good contract that you might not otherwise be able to find. I just think this is so funny because it just completely falls into that area of bridge is life. And Mm -hmm. I do know you and I love how competitive you are and how particular you are and how you are across all these things. But yeah, maybe it is worth just having in your pocket a yeah. four convention card, she says with quotation marks. Air Standard quotes. American yellow card. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, but even that is more complicated. Yeah, even you know? less than that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, even less than that. Yeah, I think when I said those conventions too, I think actually yeah. Larry Cohen was the one who, who said, I think they're the four that he teaches. But yeah, so many, so many of our guests have just talked about even playing a really natural system that I know this isn't your point, but you're better off just really being solid about those basic things and focusing on your judgment and all the rest of it. So, you know, I think I would have really resisted that. It might be even six weeks ago, but as you're speaking, I'm thinking, you know what, I even wouldn't mind playing a game with you one time where we just like go completely natural or just play like three conventions and just see what happens. I can't do it. Not with you. (laughs) Not with you. No way. But maybe I will consider it. I mean, it did not occur to me to just go in there very, very bare bones when I understood this guy to be someone who knew lots and lots of conventions would play anything I wanted him to play as evidenced by his knowledge of Gazilli. And I, I just couldn't resist trying to get aligned with him. I think part of it for me, Catherine, is that I... I'm much more confident about my bidding than I am about my play. And I think if I give up on the bidding, sort of the accuracy of the bidding through the use of some conventions, it's going to it's going to really hurt because I won't be able to make it up on the other end with my fabulous defense. Yeah. I think we all like to stay in our comfort zones and I, you know, you do have a brilliant memory and I can see that for you, there's a certainty about having those agreements and knowing what they are because you know them and, and so it's a secure place to come from, you know, and I think this is partly why there is an emphasis on just only playing a few conventions and really being across them before you move on because Ideally, we all want to be playing from as much certainty as possible because obviously the game is about so much uncertainty. Yeah, I guess the realization that dawned on me later is that it doesn't have to mirror the types of games that I have with established partnerships. It can be a completely different thing and I can maybe get a lot out of it and not try to push it towards what I'm more comfortable and used to. So, yeah, something to think about, Mm. getting a a very simple card for the next time this comes up and just be like, here, we're going to (laughs) do stamen transfers and Blackwood. (laughs) And take out doubles. And take out doubles, of course. (laughs) Thank you, Larry. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Larry. Three letters today, Jocelyn. (laughs) (laughs) Woohoo! Yeehaw. <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> Our first one is from John, who's written to us before about making seven no Trump bids and then never expecting to make them again. And now he's written <laughs> to us to share another one with us, another seven no Trump bid. This month, playing a zero to 750 game online, my partner showed 18 to 19 high card points. I had a big hand and immediately jumped to seven no Trump. It was a simple contract to make. My partner wanted to claim before the opening lead, but she figured that would be bad behavior. My only surprises were that, one, the opponents had two jacks between them. I thought they could only have one. 
and that even though I thought it was going to be a flat board, most pairs didn't bid seven no trump. We scored a very pleasing 86%. Unfortunately, we also scored three zeros in the other 17 boards. <laughs> Overall, we scored well, but not great. Once again, I expect to never play another seven no trump contract, John. Oh, don't be so pessimistic, John. You'll get you'll get more seven no trumps and maybe sometimes you'll even be doubled and and make it. Yeah, that'd be nice. Do you remember the last time you played seven no trump? I think I helped put my partner in seven no trump not that long ago, but I didn't play it. She did. Right. Oh, well, very good. Jocelyn, our next letter today is from Jamie in Indiana, and Jamie is a new player and is writing to us because they've just used Blackwood for the first time. Oh, wow. Well, that's exciting. It is exciting. (laughs) Do you remember your first time, Catherine, (laughs) with Blackwood? I do not. Do you remember (laughs) yours? I don't, but I can only imagine that it was extremely, extremely exciting. Yeah, well, Jamie said they couldn't sleep after the game because it worked out really well. Her partner wasn't sure that she remembered how to play it because they've just learned it, but they ended up in five spades passing out exactly where they should because they were missing a couple of aces and it all worked out brilliantly. And, And she talks about how that's why she really loves to play bridge because not only will she always remember her first time playing Blackwood, but she had such a great time playing with her friends. So that's really great. That is really great. I mean, I feel like you do that and you get that excitement with a lot of new things that you do for the first time in bridge and otherwise. But like, I felt that way the first time we used the witch Gazilli, which I know I'm obsessed with. (laughs) And I know that like, if I execute even the most elementary squeeze, I mean, I just feel like I've conquered Everest or something. So, yeah. Our last letter this week is from Phil in Manchester in England. Hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. He writes, hi, ladies. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now and recently heard your interview with Welsh champion Richard Blackett, where he mentioned a hand with both opponents having a penalty card on the table at the same time. (laughs) Well... I was playing in an event last weekend where my right-hand opponent was in three no trump with a diamond suit of ace-jack-10-7 in in hand opposite king-9-6-3-2 in dummy. I held the singleton five and early in the play my partner dropped all of the queen-8 and four of diamonds onto the table. (laughs) The director ruled that they were all penalty cards and de Clara could choose which order partner had to play his diamonds in. And I had also blown a trick on the lead, so that was a big round zero for us. Later in the same event, I was dummy and my right-hand opponent, six and seven of clubs, got stuck together and she played both of them at the same time. So we had two penalty card situations in one day. Face-to-face bridge is a funny game. (laughs) Yuck, indeed. That is something that would never happen online. This is true. This is true. Oh, my goodness. Oh, those are so aggravating. So if you have any fun stories about a 7 no trump contract or a first time that you used a convention, whether it was Blackwood or something else, and it really gave you a thrill, or perhaps a game with many penalty cards, please do send it to us or send us a voice message about it. These links are on our website at sorrypartner.com, along with some other good stuff. Coming up next, our interview with Bronya Jenkins. And note, this episode comes with bonus audio for our Patreon supporters. American champion Bronya Jenkins began playing bridge as a teenager, winning silver at a junior tournament at age 21. She holds three NABC titles, and she captained the USA 2 women's team at the 2017 World Bridge Championships. Now she leads the ACBL as their executive director. We began by asking how she learned to play. When I was 19 years old, and I lived in uh, North Canton, Ohio over the summer, I was, a, I was an engineering intern for the Timken Roller Bearing Company. 
And that's where I learned to play bridge. I was actually the only intern in, it was a manufacturing plant. So most of the people there were older than me, male, married. So I really didn't have too many people to hang out with as a 19 year old college student. And so I drove around there. I had a car and I drove around and asked everybody if they knew where the bridge club was, because I knew that there was bridge clubs. And I knew that I liked to play cards, but I really didn't play bridge yet. But I played a lot of hearts and spades and other kind of card games. And I learned a little about bridge, but I really didn't play bridge. And eventually it, I was at the YMCA or the YWC, I don't remember. And this lady's like, my brother is the president of the bridge club. So she's like, you, you got to call him. So I called him and he's like, come on over. And he's like, we always have a standby. So I drove to the game and they had a standby and I played with the standby. And one of the first things she asked me was, do you play Jacoby transfers? And I, of course, did not know what a Jacoby transfer was, but I was like, just remind me what they are again. You know, I don't play. So she told me. So we played and we had a great time and she was really nice. And I came back the next night and I don't think I played with her. I think I played with somebody else, but I don't remember. But I think they came and they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, you know, we're really glad you're here, but you need to go to the beginner game. <laughs> so I went to the beginner game for about three times. And then I'm like, I'm not staying in the beginner game. So I went back to the big game and I was like, I just have to play here. And then they just kind of let me play here and all the ladies would play with me and teach me how to play. So it was really, it was fun. So I went every night, would just drive over to wherever the bridge club was that was having a game that night and play uh, bridge. And I really hope we get more night games in general in the bridge world as we go forward, because for younger people, people who work, you know, it's, it's kind of important. At the time, I didn't mind having the longer games I'd love to see some shorter games in the evening so that people can actually do it without being super tired. I remember that I pretty much fell asleep on my desk every day at work on a bridge book. After staying out all night discussing the hands with the ladies, I remember my boss walking into my office once in my little cubicle, not an office, my cubicle. And I was like lying on, on the bridge book asleep. And he's like, oh my God, bro. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, whatever. But basically that's how I had caught the bridge bug. And I don't know that I did that much work after that. I think pretty much I was just all focused on bridge. And when you went back to college, did you continue playing seriously? So, yeah, when I went back to college, that's, I, I joined the MIT Bridge World. A friend of mine from Ohio actually came up, introduced me to some people in the, in the Boston Bridge World. One of the guys from MIT named Dan Nussbaum became my bridge partner. He had a motorcycle. We used to drive all around Boston playing bridge, and we had, we had the best time. And you still managed to graduate? I did still manage to graduate. <laughs> I, my problems were early on in my college career. Like my first year was a problem. Now, after that, I was actually okay. Despite bridge. Despite <laughs> or, bridge. Or notwithstanding bridge. Notwithstanding bridge, exactly. So did you continue to play then once you graduated from college? So yeah, once I graduated from college, actually the uh, summer of 90, I went to the Nationals, which was in Boston. And that's where I met a lot of people that I'm still friends with today. So I, I was moving to Chicago because I was working for a company called O'Connor and Associates, which was an options trading company in Chicago. And I became bridge partners with Martha Katz and started playing with a lot of Chicago players on GNT teams, all sorts of things. And so I played a, a good amount of bridge in Chicago. I used to take all of my vacations to go to tournaments. And I was so basically all my friends in Chicago were pretty much either from the bridge world or from the work world. And so that was really fun. And I actually went to Las Vegas in the summer of 91 and played with Brad Moss, Jared Lillianstein, Katie Thorpe, John Carruthers. And we ended up winning the Master Mix, which nobody could believe. I remember walking around the halls and people said to us, who won the Master Mix? And we're like, we did. And they're like, no, really, who won the Master Mix? I'm like, no, we did. And they really didn't believe us. And I'm just going to say that it was Brad's first national. So I'm very proud of that, that uh, Brad won his first nationals with me. He's obviously won a whole bunch since then, but I started him off on his career. And when I came home from that tournament, they called me into the office and they're like, uh, we want you to move to Basel. And I was like, Basel, that's in Switzerland. And I was like, what about my bridge? What about bridge? And they're like, we don't care. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so they made me move to Basel. And I still played bridge when I moved to Basel, I have to say. I didn't come back so much, so much for the nationals, but I got in with some good Swiss players and I was playing at some Swiss tournaments and doing that kind of stuff. And then from Switzerland, we moved to London and I still played when I got to London and I was playing with some of the London players. I played with Michelle Hendley, who was, who was a good friend, who became a good friend of mine and was my bridge partner. And I uh, met my husband 
who was from work world, not bridge world. And so then a bridge sort of went out the window and I was just fully in the work world. We played a lot of golf. And uh, so we became like, you know, the game became golf for a while instead of bridge. And then I was working and then I got married and then I had kids and all these things kind of ended up taking precedence over bridge. So then how did you get back into it? After London, I moved to Sydney for a short while and then from Sydney came back to France for a while and then went back to the United States. And when I came back to the United States, I kind of re-ran into some bridge people and decided I, I wanted to be back in the bridge world. And I was not really working full time in the financial industry anymore. So I felt like I had time to go back to the bridge world. Did you ever run into the people from Canton, Ohio when you were playing? Oh, in- yeah, for sure. Because yeah. a lot of those people actually play active bridge at the Nationals. Phil Becker's one of them. Ken Craniac. There's lots of people who came from that world who were at Dick Early, Larry Long, um, who who showed up at the tournaments that I would see. Absolutely. That's great. They must have been thrilled to see you there. Yes. No, I mean, and I still talk to some of them now. Yeah. They remember. So you are now the executive director of the ACBL. Congratulations. How did that come about? Well, first, thank you very much. And um, it's really exciting and fun to be here. And I really love coming to work every day. It came about because I became a real empty nester. So I was supposed to be an empty nester in 2020. And then, of course, we know 2020 was a confusing year for most people. And so it turned out that my kids who were supposed to be in college were actually right at the dining room table right next to me. And there were extra kids there even. So I went from being an empty, what I thought was going to be an empty nester to the opposite of that. So then it took a couple more years for me to actually become an empty nester. And, and when, I, when I realized that, you know, things were kind of back to normal, I knew that I was not necessarily going to stay in Florida, which is where I raised my children forever. And I was kind of looking for a new avenue. And in looking for that new avenue, I sort of called everyone I knew from the past and said, I'm kind of looking to get back into full-time work. I thought I had time to do that you know, once my kids were actually gone. And I started talking to people. I went to London and met with a bunch of people. I went to New York. I went to Chicago. And at the same time, I decided, well, I have some time since I'm not actually working. And I was playing some bridge. And so I went to a bridge tournament in Sarasota. And I remember I was scrolling through the acbl.org website to look at a score, I think, from the week before even. And I saw the ACBL looking for executive director. I really didn't even know what executive director really was, but I clicked on the link. It brought up a description of the job. I looked at everything on the job. I'm like, oh, I could do that. I could do that. You know, I I kind of said, okay, I could do all those things. And then I closed it and I kind of didn't think about it anymore. When I was in Sarasota, people were just talking about it in general. And some friends of mine, specifically Jay Whipple, was saying, you know, that, wow, you'd be good for this job. And I was like, yeah, I would be good for this job. And then I talked to a couple more people. I was like, yeah, you would be good for this job. And so I decided to apply and I sent my resume in, which was ready since I had been interviewing and talking to people. And I wrote a cover letter. I sent it into the chair of the search committee. And I will say that they were very responsive and and they emailed me back very quickly and organized a Zoom call. We had a Zoom call, then we had another Zoom call, then we had another Zoom call, and then all of a sudden I'm here. Wow. If you were going to tell people in a summary what you are hoping to do in the role, what would you say? So I love the idea of being the ambassador of Bridge and being kind of the face of Bridge. I think that, you know, it suits me very well. I love, I think I'm a good problem solver and I I like being in an office. I really wanted to be in an office type job as opposed to like a remote job or anything like that. And so I love having to deal with all the different types of people. And so I feel like the ACBL role is both inward facing, like how do you make the ACBL a successful place from an employee point of view? How do we work together? What are the processes that we're trying to do? How do we market ourselves? And then the second bit of it is really how do we do things from an external point of view, how to reach out to people. And I felt like I would be good in both those roles. One, because I know a lot of people in the bridge world. Two, because I enjoy talking and meeting with people. And because I think I'm a good organizer slash problem solver. So I thought all those things would really fit well what the role of the ACBL person should be, the role of the executive director of the ACBL should be. There was a lot of excitement in the bridge community and the bridge press. How do you feel about that expectation? You know, it's funny because a a good friend of mine, he's like, 
you know, you're going to get there and they're going to expect you to be able to do everything and like, you know, everything should be solved already. And he's like, and, and he's like, don't let that, don't let that come down on you in the sense of don't let yourself feel like you have to fix everything in, in one minute or in one day, because it's not going to happen. It's hard to do. And so give yourself time to kind of make a plan and do the right thing. I don't feel a lot of pressure. People often ask me, like, are you stressed or whatever? I'm like, uh, we play cards. I don't know what you want me to be stressed about. You know, like we're, we're playing a card game. I don't, I, you know, so it's really not, I'm going to do the best I can. And I think I'm going to do a good job. And so far it's been really, really fun. And people are responding very well. And we have all sorts of problems and it's very difficult. And I'm trying not to make decisions too quickly. I'm trying to really learn about how we do things before I decide how we change things. Although I'm pretty impatient in general. So when I see something I don't like, or I see something that could be done differently, I kind of want to change it right away. And sometimes I have to kind of step back and say, okay, let's think about what we're doing here so that we kind of do it right. So an example of that is like in Chicago at the nationals, I initially was like, we should run all these events, all these new things, whatever. And I'm like, you know what, let's run one event and see if we can do that properly. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, that event goes well, I'm calling it beyond bridge game on. And it's all about playing games together that is that are not necessarily bridge and that are doing it for fun and for community purposes. And I'm a big proponent of social fitness and social welfare and how being together and playing games really helps create mental and, and physical wellness, but really mental wellness and creates bonds between people who may not normally have these bonds. You know, there's there's definitely people in today's world that have social awkwardness. And I think being able to play a game together actually kind of helps reduce that social awkwardness and creates a link through the cards. You can create a bond through the cards. And it's not about being able to have a conversation necessarily even outside of what the game is teaching you. So that's kind of a big thing for me. I noticed that when I was teaching the kids how to play cards, like in my at school, because I was teaching math for juniors and seniors. So I did a lot of game playing. And what I noticed that is that most kids today don't even know how to play cards. They don't know about a deck of cards. They don't know how many cards are in a deck. They don't know the suits. They don't know Jack, King, Queen, Ace, you know, or I should say Jack, Queen, King, Ace. And then once they learn how to do it, they really like it. So it's really about getting people to pick up cards and hold cards in their hands and play cards. That's really what it's about to me. What are you seeing now as the biggest challenges facing the ACBL? So, I mean, we have several large challenges. Bringing people back to face-to-face, -to -face, it's hard to change people's behavior. So when coronavirus happened and people got put in their houses and they were not lo no longer going to the bridge club, that becomes an easier thing to do to not go to the bridge club. So how do we get people to not do the easy thing and not go to the bridge club, but rather get up and go to the bridge club? In today's world, you have endless entertainment at your fingertips with a phone. You could go for a walk, you could go to the gym, you could go to the bridge club, or you could watch Netflix. Well, I think I'm going to watch Netflix today because it's just so easy. So getting people to look up from their phone and realize that there's something else is a major challenge. How do we moderate online bridge? What should online bridge look like? You know, I think online bridge is a phenomenal thing for tons of people who may be housebound, who may not have a bridge club next to them, who may want to play it off hours, who may want to play a shorter game. And we want to totally encourage online bridge. But how do we do that without stepping on each other's toes? How do we make sure that, you know, because I think face-to-face -face bridge is very important and I think they are different games. Okay. And so how do we kind of look at those games differently and encourage people to do both in the best way possible? So that's a challenge. People don't know what bridge is. When I walk around and ask people, do you know, you know, and I tell them I work for the American contract bridge league, they think I work in construction, either that, or they're like, if you're talking to people who are under 40, they'll say like, oh, my grandparents used to play bridge kind of thing, not my parents. And so when we grew up, there was less around and people played cards, played bridge. And now you don't have that nearly as much. And bridge is a hard game, you know, but it's not that hard, but it, people also think bridge is a hard game. So they just kind of are intimidated, afraid to go, afraid to make a mistake. I think you cannot be afraid to make a mistake. You just have, everybody makes mistakes. We can see it every time when we watch people play. So you just have to go and be willing to make the mistake and, and be willing to do the wrong thing so that you learn how to do better things. And you're never going to do everything right. So 
I think those are some major challenges in the world of bridge. Young people are very much driven by all things online. So the getting them off of online into the bridge club is a very difficult task. Even getting them online into online bridge is a difficult task. So, you know, those are kind of things that we need to work on. What I'd like to do in general is to be all things bridge to all people, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. Different tranches of people have different needs and different wants out of what the ACBL should give to them. And what the ACBL should be doing is giving them what they want in the way that they play bridge. I don't want to try to change the way people play bridge. I want to give them more access. And I want to be able to get them to become better bridge players from where they are, as opposed to say, you have to become a duplicate player. I don't necessarily think everybody needs to be a duplicate player. If you're a social player, if you're playing for fun, that is still playing bridge. And even just playing cards, forget bridge, even cards, spades, hearts, euchre, these are all trump games that can lead you to playing bridge. And hopefully people's journey goes from the simpler games into a better version of a beginner bridge game, into the ACBL, but not into the ACBL top division, which is the duplicate division. But that doesn't mean that everyone is going to end up playing duplicate bridge. I'm completely happy if there's tons of people playing bridge who are members of the ACBL who never play one hand of duplicate bridge. What do you see as the main benefits or reasons for people to play? So to me, games are about having fun. And so to me, like I want when people play bridge, I want them to have fun playing bridge. When you have fun and you're smiling and you're laughing, then you just are just a happier person in general. And that carries over into other things. So it's really important for me for us to realize that things have to be fun and that people have to be kind. One of the the kindergarten at the school that I worked at the 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 theme was always scatter kindness. And I really try to scatter kindness wherever I go. And I also think one of my main goals in life is to radiate positive energy. And I think when you are able to radiate positive energy, you can bring good things to the world, even if it's in, in small ways. And so I really want to focus on that for people at the bridge table to radiate positive energy and to have fun. Looking into your crystal ball, what do you see as significant changes coming for Bridge in the next, let's say, five, 10 years? What I'm hoping for is that the Bridge community is more united. So I think there's lots of people that play Bridge, but I don't necessarily think that we are well connected to each other. So my, you know, what I'd love to see is more connection. What I'd love to see is the ACBL being the connector of people in the bridge world, all, you know, all over the place. I'd love to be able to figure out how we can all be one big bridge community in some way, you know, and, and it starts with the ACBL at the national level, you know, Bermuda, Canada, Mexico, the United States, we're all together. How do we become even more together? And then how do we partner with everybody? How, do, how does the ACBL become a partner to people for bridge? And how do you think it does? By being a connector. So I think our job is to be the connector of bridge and to connect people, whether it be to other players so they can find partners, whether it be to information online so that they can know where their game is going on, whether it be to information online that teaches them things about the game, you know, to be able to give people something from bridge that is useful to them. And it's not like you don't have enough to do in the role, but do you see that there's a way of connecting the ACBL with other bridge organizations from other countries? Yes, I'm reaching out to other bridge federations and seeing how we can collaborate together. I think we all need to collaborate together as best we can, and we're all busy and we're all doing our thing. So I'm not, you know, there's no uh, real expectations, but I would love to be able to build our community in a more robust way and strengthen our community. What are the bridge goals that you want to achieve with your own game? I would love to be a world champion. That would really be awesome. I mean, I guess I've always dreamed of being a world champion and I'm not one so far, but I'm going to keep working on it. Unfortunately, I can't work on it right now because I'm doing this instead, but that's okay. So we'll have to, we'll have to figure out how we do it later. Are there any aspects of your game that you feel you specifically want to be working on in the future? 
Well, I mean, focus is always a big one, right? Like being able to stay focused all the way through and to not get frustrated and to accept when you've made a mistake and something's gone wrong and not let it play back in your mind so that you can move on to the next hand. And I know the top players are really good at that. You know, I, I can definitely let something bother me a few hands into it that will end up affecting the way I do the next hand because I'm still thinking about the last hand. So that would be a great thing. I work on that actively and I think I've gotten better over time, but that's something that I would still like to be better at. Obviously, technically speaking, you know, with all technical aspects of the game, who would not want to get better? I'd love to get better, but you know, there's not a specific, I wish I was better at the bidding or I wish I was better at the declare play or, you know, Counting. I guess I wish I was better at counting. Counting is good. Yeah. People sometimes say, didn't you count? I'm like, no, I lost count. I lost count. You know, <laughs> so that happens to me. When you say you're working on the focus, are there specific tools that you are employing? Well, I think the key is to uh, not get upset. I think that's the key. So I guess some breathing is probably a good thing, like take a breath. I think if you really feel like you need to, you might want to Depending on what kind of game you're playing in, you can, you know, stand up and do a stretch and take a mini walk or something. You know, if, if it, you know, you're in the middle of a segment kind of thing, if you're in, the, in between two segments, like actually, you know, maybe walking outside the room and taking a mini walk and coming back, you know, or in ha halfway through the game, something like that. If you're really during a segment, it's kind of hard to really kind of walk away. So then it's just kind of like maybe closing your eyes for a second and taking a couple breaths and trying to come back to the present and not going to the past. What's your best bridge memory? So I would say my best bridge memory is probably that first nationals that I won. It was really quite incredible. I had only been playing bridge for, I don't know, two years, I guess. I had no idea how special it was that I, we won this nationals, but then, you know, looking back upon it, I mean, I was very happy right then, obviously, but looking back upon it, it seems even more special. And I, and I really have this memory of walking down the halls in the Las Vegas tournament. Like, you know, like just, I remember like the carpet and the walls and just walking down the halls with my team and how much fun it was. And my second favorite memory is probably getting to be USA two in the women's trials in 2017. And I was playing with Sherry and with Sylvia Moss, Bernice, Connie and um, Irina. And we were up a lot going into the last segment. Me and Sherry went to play against uh, Roseanne Pollock and Sherry Birkin, I, I think. And we got destroyed. Like it was just awful what happened to us. I was like, oh my God. And I remember we, but we were, we were up a, a lot of imps. We, I think we were up 46 imps or some large amount of imps. And we walked back into the open room because we were in the closed room. We walked back and there was our, the rest of our team was there. And there was a couple of other people there. Billy was there and they're all laughing. Ha, 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 ha. And I was like, you guys better stop laughing, you know, because we need to compare like we really had a bad set. Like everybody's got to stop laughing right now. And so we sat down and we compared it. Of course, it was, you know, lose 12, lose 10, whatever. And Billy was behind me and he was adding as we were going. And I think we ended up winning by like six or eight or 12. I don't remember, but we held on. And uh, at the end, I looked up at Billy and he's like, no, you still won. I was like, oh, thank God, because I was, you know, that was just going to be so horrible if we won. And we were so excited. And that was really actually also quite fun. And then I did an interview with Oren afterwards. And, and uh, I love watching that interview either on uh, Bridge Winners. We did the interview and I, I even love now going back and watching that interview. Are there any books that have really helped your game or books that you really like to recommend to other people to read? So I've read lots of bridge books and I've really enjoyed reading all those bridge books. And there are different kinds of books that are like quizzes or that are stories or that are, you know, instructional. But the two books that really stick out in my mind are The Killing Defense and The Play of the Hand at Bridge. Do you have a favorite bridge convention or gadget that you really like to play? I do really like fit showing jumps. That's one of my favorite conventions because I feel like when you get to make a fit showing jump, like your partner really knows a lot about what's going on in the hand. Are there any conventions that you detest that you really don't like There's to play? There's so <laughs> many. There's so many. It's not even so much that uh, there are conventions I don't like. 
a lot of times people say, do you play, you know, let's play this. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. You have to tell me what it means and then I can play it. But I don't necessarily know all the names of the conventions. And I don't want to say any bad things about any convention, but there's lots of conventions that I refuse to play. Why don't you want to say anything, <laughs> any bad things about Well, because they're all names, you know, and I don't <laughs> have a problem with the people. I just have a problem with the conventions. Mm. <laughs> well, that's very diplomatic of you. Thank you. <laughs> Part of my new role, diplomacy. <laughs> Who would have thought it? No one would have thought <laughs> it when I was young, that's for sure. What's the best bridge tip or advice that you've ever been given? The best bridge tip of advice is like if you're thinking about something for more than 10 seconds, you know, you're probably making a mistake in some way. So like, like trust your gut and kind of like go with what your thoughts should be. Don't be like, don't talk yourself out of doing the right thing. Bronya, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. It was great speaking with you. Thank you so much, Catherine and Jocelyn. Thank you for what you do. It is so much fun. It is so great to get to listen to people talk about their bridge stories. And I love listening to your podcast. And I love that you asked me to be on your podcast. So thank you so much. And that's the show. Many thanks to our guest, Bronya Jenkins. Thank you also to our Sorry Partner Posse of listener supporters who make the show possible. Sorry Partner is produced by Catherine Harris with production assistance from Jade Gray and David Turner. Our theme music was composed by Jocelyn Starts and produced by Daniel Graboy. Send your bridge stories and comments to sorrypartnerpodcast at gmail.com or send us a voice message. And please consider joining the Sorry Partner Posse that helps keep us on the air, so to speak. You'll get ad-free episodes, a monthly newsletter, bonus audio from time to time, and other supporter perks. These links are in the show notes and on our website at sorrypartner.com. We'd love to hear from you, but be nice, (laughs) or we'll call the director. Until next time, play well. May all your finesses be on side. And remember, as Bronia says, trust your gut. If you're thinking about something for more than 10 seconds, you're probably making a mistake. (laughs) Oops. (laughs) Thank you, partner. Thank you, partner. (laughs) Bye. Bye.